So, good evening, everyone. I am Amit Raj Pehra, and I welcome you all to the first talk of STEM 2022 lecture series. For the next three months, we will have several exciting talks on various topics, presenting you with the beauty of mathematical sciences. And what can be a better start to this than having the renowned mathematician Professor Ken Ono with us? I am sure many of you already know him, but let me give you a brief introduction about him. Professor Ken Ono is the Thomas Jefferson Met Professor of Mathematics at the University of Virginia and the Chair of Mathematics Section of the American Association for the Adv Advancement of Science. His research interests are mainly in algebra, combinatorics, algebraic geometry, and number theory. He has received the Distinguished uh, Spotlight Researcher Award from the University of Virginia in 2020. Professor Ken Nono also heads the Spirit of Ramanujan, a beautiful initiative to support emerging engineers, mathematicians, and scientists through financial grants and providing them with uh, beautiful mentorship opportunities. He served as an associate producer and mathematical consultant for the famous film, The Man Who Knew Infinity which I believe all of you have watched it. Today, he will be delivering a talk about the life of Srinivas Ramanujan and how his works continue to influence a large part of present day mathematics. Before we begin, a couple of points. It would be great if all of you could turn on their videos so that we can reach closer to having a live session, which we all have been missing for more than a year. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat or unmute yourself and ask directly to the professor. Without further delay, I invite Professor Kenono. I hope all of you enjoyed the talk. Over to you. All right, thank you very much. It's, 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 delayed. it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here to, to speak with you today. Uh, I will be talking about, of course, one of my favorite topics of all time. And uh, I hope this, hope this lecture has uh, something that uh, speaks to you either mathematically or perhaps a little bit in terms of history. So uh, as I understand, uh, most of you, maybe all of you are pursuing careers in science and mathematics, perhaps at different levels, depending on your age. And so it's a, it's a bit of a challenge for me to assemble, I think, uh, a, a, a collection of topics that speaks to everyone. And so I hope I, I, I have chosen well. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, Ramanujan's influence and contributions to the theory of partitions, including some recent results that still rely on his work. Uh, but before I get to that, I think it's important uh, for me to tell you about why I think Ramanujan matters. Uh, and I'm gonna tell that story largely from a Western perspective because we're all part of an international global community. Our, our backgrounds are very different. And I'd, I'd like to tell you about how we view Ramanujan in, in the Western uh, scientific world. So let me begin. This lecture is called Adding and Counting the Legacy of Ramanujan. And let me begin with a little bit of history. So the easiest way for us, at least in the, in the West, in the United States to try to put and place Ramanujan into perspective is to, to recognize that he lived for us a very long time ago. And despite the fact that um, we still talk about him in our classrooms and, our, and in our mathematics conferences, uh, perhaps the best way for us to start is to travel back in time and forget for the moment uh, about who he was and who he became as a scientist. So, Easiest way for me to do this is to travel back in time and tell you about what life was like uh, for us here, say in the United States in, 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 and in Europe. Here in the United States in 1893, uh, the, the citizens of the United States were preparing to, to, to celebrate uh, one of the world's fairs. So I quite honestly don't know if we still celebrate world's fairs today, but certainly through the 1980s, every four years, uh, there were world fairs all over the world and they were meant to celebrate the state of the art in science and technology. And in 1893, Chicago was um, preparing to host its world fair. So here's a photograph of what's called the Midway Plaisance in Chicago. 
If you've never been there, this place is very easy to find today because this is now the present site of the famous University of Chicago. I was an undergraduate student at the University of Chicago. It, it, it may be today a very well-known famous university, but in 1893, this was when the doors to the University of Chicago opened. So in, in the context of history, uh, 1893 isn't that long ago. And what was the point about the, this World's Fair in 1893? A number of things that I'd like to point out were important. In a funny sense, the World's Fair in 1893 was the first location of a Ferris wheel, a fir the first carnival ride. So these are things that maybe we all take for granted today, but the very first one appeared in that World's Fair. <laughs> Movies, we live in the digital age, but the di digital age with regard to when compared to the uh, human history is really quite recent. It's less than 1% of human history. Moving pictures were introduced at this World's Fair in 1893. If you like chocolate, if you like chocolate, maybe you've heard of the Hershey's Chocolate Bar Company in the United States. Hershey's as a company was founded around 1893 and their bars were introduced here at the World's Fair. What does this have to do with mathematics? Well, uh, it turns out that a, a great tradition was launched at this World's Fair in 1893 the first International Congress of Mathematicians was part of this World's Fair. The International Congress of Mathematicians no longer is part of the World's Fair, but we continue to hold them every four years. And this is the, the, the major celebration where the Fields Medals are awarded. Uh, not so long ago, in the, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, the International Congress of Mathematicians was, was held in, in India. In, Hyderabad. So maybe some of you uh, either attended that or know about that great event. So 1893 marks uh, a particularly important point in time. So we might ask, how did India participate in the 1893 World's Fair? And this is where uh, we, we quickly learned that the world really was difficult to define way back then. It turns out that there were no existing from India. There were no talks by Indian mathematicians. And what really comes as a surprise is if you fast forward to today, it's hard to imagine that anything that would be called a World's Fair would not have major contributions uh, from India. Certainly, just visit any major university in the world, and uh, most math departments have their fair share of Indian mathematicians on their faculty but this was not the case in 1893. So the world has come a long way since, uh, since this time. What was important, and, and the reason I chose 1893, is that Ramanujan's life was beginning around that time as a young boy, an infant in South India. So here's, a, one of the, here's the famous passport photo of Ramanujan, I think that you've all known it. Uh, but for you, maybe you would think that Ramanujan lived a very, very long time ago, but I hope the point that I'd like to make is that a long time ago is really a relative term, right? In terms of the luxuries of modern life, this was actually not that long ago. And in terms of how much progress has been made in science, well, in some respects, it, we have come a long way, but in many other respects, we have not come a long way because if Ramanujan had never lived, many of the things I'm about to describe would have never happened. So I hope this is a beginning to this lecture, which is rather, which I hope uh, uh, is reason for reflection, uh, because uh, there are many reasons why we celebrate Ramanujan today. And perhaps the first one, the most important one, is that his story, even independent of his legacy, Really, spe really speaks to a changing of the world order, where the world really now is a much smaller place than it was, say, at the turn of the century, 19th to 20th. So what is this great legend of Ramanujan? You know it, but let me tell you how we teach it here in, in the United States. It's, it's about a young boy who was born in a very far away place, the state of Tamil Nadu, in 1887 in lush South India. So if you uh, teach the courses that I teach, almost no students 
have ever heard of Erode. Probably none of them have heard of Tamil Nadu. Of course, they've heard of India, but India is a very far away place. And Ramanujan was born into a very different culture, right? So you have to talk about uh, uh, the culture and, and, and how that impacts and reflects uh, young students, people who want to pursue careers in academia. Ramanujan was born a Brahmin. And here in the United States, this is something we understand. Many of the Indians that uh, we come to, to work with and become our colleagues turn out to, for whatever reason, many of them end up, uh, turn out to be Brahmins. Ramanujan was born the son of a cloth merchant who was not a very well, didn't come from a very wealthy family. And he was raised in a very, very interesting town, the town of Kumbakonam. I visited many times, uh, but for my students who may never visit Kumbakonam, it's, it's, it, it offers the opportunity to have a lively discussion about how life in different parts of the world are very different. So I like to talk about uh, what's, what I'm sure you know very well, the Mahamaham festival. Uh, it's an it's, it's incredible pilgrimage where Hindus descend on Kumbakonam uh, uh, every, if, if, I, if I remember correctly, is it every 12 years or something along those lines? And when you tell students in the United States things like this, it, their, eyes, their, their eyes just and, and their mouths drop open because they quickly realize that Although from their perspective, the United States is the world, it's kind of a humbling reality to recognize the world is a very big place with many different cultures, with many different points of view. So it is out of this cultural upbringing that we come to learn about uh, this great mathematician Ramanujan. And it's difficult for us to understand him because he doesn't come from uh, backgrounds that certainly people that I generally teach come to understand. We can, of course, flip the tables. Uh, the world is a big place. And so I think it was important for me to, to open this lecture this way. So it won't come as a surprise. I think all of you know this. Ramanujan was an excellent student when he was a young boy. He even earned scholarships to college. But what is unusual about Ramanujan is that uh, bucking the trend for what most talented students uh, follow uh, when they pursue careers. Bucking that trend, Ramanujan ended up striking out a path of his own. One of the major turning points in his life is that a friend introduced to him this book by G.S. Carr called A Synopsis of Elementary Results in Pure Mathematics. And this in no way is a remarkable book. This was a book that a tutor would use to prepare students for college entrance exams. This is what this book's role was in England at the time. And uh, this book would later be described as follows. I quote, the synopsis it professes to be, this book, it contains enunciations of 6,165 theorems systematically and quite scientifically arranged with proofs which are often little more than cross-references. Now, Ramanujan became infatuated with mathematics because he saw beauty in the formulas recorded in this book. And his raison d'etre, his passion in life, which would persist for the rest of his life, would be to produce and discover his own formulas. And not knowing that there was another way of going about doing mathematics, Ramanujan then ended up recording his own formulas in notebooks on pages very much like this, emulating the, em, emulating the style that he found in Carr's book. Now, these notebooks, I'm sure Ramanujan never intended to share with anyone else. These were his own personal notebooks. And so the fact that he died at a very young age, leaving behind these notebooks poses many problems to the scientists and mathematicians of Ramanujan's future. So just take a quick scan of this particular page from chapter 18. Uh, I think it's page 213. I think you can read it. I uh, uh, apologize that this is not a color scan, but I think you can quite see it. There are almost no words on this page. And so if you, like most mathematicians who try to study Ramanujan's notebooks, uh, were to flip through them and try to make any sense out of the formulas, you, it would be a challenge. Generally, there is 
we define a function to be such and such. And then there are theorems and remarks and there's paragraphs of discussion elaborating on the, on the expressions and formulas. But you certainly don't find that here in Ramanujan's notebook. Notice here on page 213, in the middle of the page, you find a, bu a bunch of decimal places for pi with no, dis no reason as to why it would just happen to appear in the middle of this page. All right, well, Ramanujan left behind three notebooks filled with pages like these. And uh, although it is strictly speaking true that professional mathematicians have a fairly comprehensive understanding of, of the formulas, formulas as written, uh, I often get the question as to, so are there people still studying Ramanujan's notebooks? Well, absolutely, because many of the formulas that Ramanujan recorded were recorded for reasons that we don't know. And although the formulas can be confirmed or modified uh, case by case, uh, rarely do we have a pretty good idea of the theory that Ramanujan had in mind when he recorded these formulas. To be more explicit than that, Ramanujan wasn't uh, from the, didn't, operate from the frame of mind where he was meant to build theories, right? Nobody told him that that's one way that you could go about being a mathematician. Instead, Ramanujan collected formulas. The theories were presumably in his mind, uh, uh, but that's not what he left behind in our notebooks. And so the idea of understanding the implications for these notebooks uh, definitely continues to this day. So there's one question in the chat. Yes. Uh, did some of these theorems have proofs? In the notebooks, uh, yeah. strictly, strictly speaking, uh, well, no. All right. Some of these, some of these formulas in the notebooks had um, were special cases of more general formulas that he also recorded in the notebooks, and that's the closest thing I can offer to you as something that would resemble either uh, a justification of a formula or but I wouldn't even go as far as calling any of any of them a, a rigorous proof. So returning to the cultural aspect, how 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 were we told, or how 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 was Ramanujan's methods uh, generally explained to us? Well, I don't know how to explain that. Of course, there are the there there are many accounts of the statement that Ramanujan believe that his findings came to him as visions from goddess Namagiri. I've personally visited the temple. It's really quite an impressive place, uh, both in terms of history and, and, and in terms of just the, uh, the geological formation is really quite startling. But the idea that his, his mathematics came to him as visions from a goddess is certainly something that is difficult for us to understand. Uh, and maybe for many of you also, perhaps a little bit uh, mysterious. Ramanujan gave essentially no proofs of any kind, and that's been an, uh, a major challenge for us. And at, 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 at and from a very early age, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Ramanujan found his raison d'etre, his reason for being. It, it involved only the pursuit of more formulas, and so it then doesn't come as a surprise that Ramanujan ended up losing interest in everything other than his mathematics. Now, if Ramanujan were to be alive today, and he and he, if he had lost interest in all of his subjects other than mathematics, that's a thought that is frightening for me, because if you pause and reflect on how much education has changed in the world since Ramanujan's time, I, I regret to say that I think Ramanujan might be lost. Right, he might be lost in lost in this rigid educational system, which, which, which is driven by the pursuit of high test scores, the pursuit of perfect grades. And in Ramanujan, we have exactly the opposite. We have nothing but the sheer pursuit of knowledge. At the end of the day, that's what's important in science. But certainly as a student, uh, most students, unlike Ramanujan, aren't ready yet to uh, pursue unknown uh, cutting edge ideas. And so the story of Ramanujan offers a lot for us that we can learn in terms of how do we make it possible to, so that, so that uh, you know, really engaging and enthusiastic young scientists somehow aren't either overburdened or lost 
because of rigid uh, educational systems. Even Ramanujan flunked out of college. It's really quite remarkable that he, his ideas weren't lost, uh, but uh, obviously they weren't. And this is the stuff of movies, not so to speak movies, really is the stuff of movies. So as, as was mentioned earlier, I was a, a participant in the production of the film, The Man Who Knew Infinity, one of several films about Ramanujan. I know there have also been films in, in India and you only make films about people who matter. So Ramanujan ended up being in sort of a mathematical purgatory for a short period of time. But to, to their credit, his parents and other benefactors continued to support him. I think that was very important. As you may know, he found work as a clerk at the Madras Port Trust. Certainly he was not wealthy, but he was able to use his skills with arithmetic, put, to that, put that to good use as an accountant. And what, what this work also allowed him to do was that it still allowed him enough spare time in his leisure to work on his mathematics to add to the formulas that were accumulating in his three notebooks. But this is a very, this must have been very difficult for him. There were very few people that he could share his ideas with who could properly appreciate what he was recording in his, in his prize notebooks. And through the inspiration of others, he was encouraged to, to write letters to mathematicians in the West who might appreciate his work. And I'm so grateful that he did that. One of the letters that he wrote was written to the famous mathematician G.H. Hardy, who was um, the Sadlerian professor of mathematics at Cambridge. And the letter begins with some very beautiful, famous words. The words are, I beg to introduce myself to you as a clerk in the accounts department of the Port Trust office in Madras. I've had no university education, but I've gone through the ordinary school course. I have not trodden through the conventional regular course, which is followed in a university course, but I'm striking out a new path for myself and the results I get are termed by local mathematicians as startling. So what's amazing is that these were his genuine words. This sounds like the beginning of a fairy tale, but fairy tales matter even more when they are based in fact. This is history, this happened. And with that letter that uh, Ramanujan wrote to Hardy, he included many pages of crazy looking formulas. Some of the formulas that Ramanujan recorded in his letter were famous and would not have impressed Hardy. In fact, probably would have irritated Hardy because he would have thought based on those formulas that, uh, the, that the author of the letter was pretending to be a genius. There were other formulas that were wrong but there were many formulas that were so original, so creative that Hardy recognized that Ramanujan could not be a fraud. In fact, on the contrary, he had to, ha had to be someone with incredible creative powers for finding formulas about continued fractions and divergent power series. And as an analyst, Hardy would have re really recognized that, and he did recognize that Ramanujan had to be someone truly quite special. So based on the, the results he found in Ramanujan's letter and some subsequent letters, Hardy felt that he had to meet Ramanujan and he needed to get at the bottom of his ideas. And so Hardy, Ram Hardy invited Ramanujan to study with him in Cambridge. At first Ramanujan declined for, for various religious reasons, uh, but as the legend goes, obviously, as uh, I'm not a historian, so I can't confirm this, but many accounts that have been forwarded to us indicate that um, uh, Ramanujan's mother received visions from their family goddess Namagiri, granting him permission to take this long voyage to England. So back in the day, such travel was prohibited. It's right it, uh, before COVID, this was quite common. But way back 100 years ago, this was very unusual. When did Ramanujan finally arrive in Cambridge? He arrived in 1914. Let me remind you that Ramanujan was born in December of 1887, all right? So Ramanujan was still quite a young man, but not super young 
when you think about how short his life was. He was born in 1887, and he finally arrives in England in 1914. So this places in, in proper perspective how short the time frame was uh, in which he was able to do the many works that I'm about to describe to you. It was a very, very narrow window of time. So what did Ramanujan do in England? He spent about the next five years, not a very long time in England, uh, taking some courses from the professors at, at Cambridge uh, and, and conducting some research, some which has gone on to be quite famous with his mentor, Hardy. Ramanujan published over 30 papers on a, an amazing array, wide array of topics in these five years. He wrote some papers on prime numbers. He certainly wrote some groundbreaking papers on hypergeometric series. He, he went a long way to modernizing the ideas of Jacobi and Euler on basic hypergeometric functions. Ramanujan built on some of the classical theory of elliptic functions to lay the groundwork for what is now called the theory of modular forms, which is, is central to modern mathematics. The proof of Fermat's last theorem relies on some of that groundwork. A lot of work presently today in string theory, where mathematical physics physicists are trying to bring Newton's theory of gravity uh, into, uh, into sync with uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. This is very difficult. It's the pursuit of quantum gravity. Ramanujan's ideas on modular forms and Mach theta functions are the bread and butter of those calculations. In elementary number theory, which I will end up end this lecture talking about, the theory of partitions uh, uh, was basically born out of the works of Ramanujan. And an entire field of probabilistic number theory that the Hungarian mathematician Paul Erdős would later make famous, writing thousands of papers using these ideas, was also born out of one little paper that Ramanujan wrote in the field. So Ramanujan's 30 papers, the legacy is really quite remarkable because it spans number theory, it spans analysis, and it set the seeds for many of the most important advances today in string theory, in mathematical physics, and even in applied subjects such as signal processing and cryptography. So as I've mentioned, Ramanujan only spent five years working at this infernal pace. And the reason was, um, was that he would get very ill during his time in England. Before he left England, uh, and, and because of severe concern for his health, uh, he was nominated for a fellowship at the Royal Society. He was elected. He was the first Indian scientist, the second Indian, but the first Indian scientist elected a fellow of the Royal Society. And he was elected at the very young age of 31. People are not generally elected fellows at such a young age. You're generally elected a fellow of a society for uh, for a lifetime achievement. It's much more common to be elected in your 50s and 60s. But Ramanujan not only bucked the trend as being, by being the first Indian selected during a very difficult time. This was a very racist society. But he overcame those biases and that discrimination to be the first Indian selected. And not only that, he did so at such a young age. He was hailed as a national hero. This you know. There was even a stamp uh, that, was, that was printed with his image. And this was all very well earned for the 30 papers that Ramanujan wrote. It's important to point out that Ramanujan, this, this is a very difficult point in the history of mankind. Just like we've struggled so much for the last year and a half with, with the pandemic. Well, in Ramanujan's day, there was a different kind of demic. It wasn't a pandemic, it was a world war. And so life would have been certainly probably more difficult in many ways for Ramanujan in, in, in England during World War I because of the not only the physical isolation, but also the hardships that are, that, are, are, that are just forced upon you because of shortages that are the result of the war. So it doesn't come to surprise that Ramanujan would, would struggle with his health. Many people did. But Ramanujan really struggled with this health. 
And towards the end of his stay in, in, in England, he ended up spending much of his time in various hospitals. He, he was able to muster the strength to return to India uh, in 1919. I think the idea was that a return to uh, his family and the more customary foodstuffs and certainly a much better climate would restore his health, but that was not meant to be. And rather tragically, he passed away at the age of 32 in 1920. So that's the story. I think you know it, but I hope you have a, 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 a perhaps even greater appreciation from the story where you hear it from a Western perspective. Okay, because for us, the story is really quite remarkable. And, 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 and I hope that I hope that resonates um, with you. Now, Ramanujan's legacy certainly goes far beyond. So I see there's que 12 qu questions in the chat, but so I can you can interrupt at any time. Otherwise, I can take them at the end. Uh, Ramanujan's legacy at the time when he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society was amazing. He, as I mentioned, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society. But make no mistake, if you ask scientists today what Ramanujan is most well known for, you will probably almost never hear about those 30 papers. What you will hear about is the legacy that those 30 papers gave birth to. People have won, many people have won Fields Medals for solving Ramanujan's problems or by using his ideas to solve major open problems in mathematics. This includes the Vey conjectures won by Deline. This includes the development of the theory of Galois representations, which, was, which is one of the major contributions of another Fields medalist, Jean-Pierre Serre. A little bit more recently, you have the field, Fields medals of people like Gerd Faltings, who was studying Diophantine equations. And the modern form of the theory of Diophantine equations is largely inspired by understanding examples of things like the ramanujan nagel equation. Even more recently, you have the work of Richard Borchards, who won the Fields Medal in 1998, solving a conjecture in group theory, the capstone of the classification of finite simple groups, which made use of Ramanujan's ideas with Hardy on asymptotic expansions for modular forms. And the story goes on. And as I mentioned, even the proof of Fermat's last theorem could not have happened had Ramanujan not written down congruences for a function he defined called Tau of N. That legacy is really remarkable. People today, even including very prominent physicists in, in India, perhaps you know the name Ashok Sen, who works at, at the Harish Chandra Institute. He was a winner of the one of the million dollar prize breakthrough awards. And uh, also there's the famous uh, theoretical mathematical physics institute in, Bang uh, in Bangalore. Uh, where Gop Gopa Kumar is, they're, they're studying uh, 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 black holes in string theory. When they study their entropies, they use, many of them, uh, use Ramanujan's formulas for mock data functions. And uh, let me just remind you, nobody knew that anything about black holes when Ramanujan was alive. So the mathematics that Ramanujan left behind gave birth to a legacy, which is really quite astonishing. There is no theory of Ramanujan. If there was, well, you'd, if we tried to make a, a, a textbook on theories developed thanks to ideas and glimpses of theories due to Ramanujan, well, you would have to write an encyclopedia. It wouldn't be a book, it would be an encyclopedia. Great. So here are some of the buzzwords you might hear in courses. And as impressive as that is, as I've just described to you, Ramanujan's legacy goes on and is certainly, um, how to say, a little bit more than breathtaking. It's really astonishing. Ramanujan for us in science was really a gift. Without Ramanujan, I don't know how far we would be behind uh, compared to where we are today in so many different fields. As you know, uh, I had the pleasure of being part of the Man Who Knew Infinity film. It wasn't perfect. It was written from the Englishman Hardy's perspective. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're like me and you're trained to be a mathematician, you never expect to get a call from Hollywood or Bollywood uh, uh, to try to bring to film the story 
that is so important to us in science. And that this is certainly one of the highlights in my career. So what I want to spend the rest of this talk about on uh, is to give you some indication of some of Ramanujan's ideas and how you could use them today to inspire young students. So let me not talk about the black holes. Let me not talk about the, 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 the inner workings of various types of uh, signal processing protocols that require Ramanujan's work. Let me show you that even at, from, from the very basics, the first kinds of questions you might ever ask, even as a school child, that Ramanujan's ideas are important. So let me tell you about how it, once you learn how to add and count, you can very, very quickly be led to state-of-the-art problems that could be very difficult to solve. So the stuff of partitions is nothing but the art of adding and counting. There are, of course, applications of this across fields, uh, but for the rest of today's talk, let's just talk about adding and counting. So in how many ways can four be written as a sum? Well, it's not a trick question. There are five ways and they are listed here. And so what you can see from this, this slide is that I'm not going to count reorderings of any partition as being a distinct partition. So we're gonna write down integers as sums of non-increasing positive integers. And in this case, there are five ways. Euler's partition function P counts these ways. And so P of four is five. Here is a definition. I'm a mathematician after all. I teach classes, so we write down definition. Here's a definition. So a partition of an integer n is any non-increasing sequence of positive integers which sum to n. So p of n is their count. This function was studied uh, first in a serious manner by Euler. So let's start with examples. The number of partitions of two is two. There's only two of them, two and one plus one, simple enough. The number of partitions of three is three, simple enough. But as simple as those first few examples are, you might be asked, is there a simple formula for P of N? And if you don't know the story, well, you might proceed by computing some more examples. So here P of two is two, P of four is five. Make your mental guess for what you think P of eight is. And I could ask, did you guess 22? If you've never done this before, 22 might be shocking to you until you start writing down, well, there's eight, there's seven plus one, there's six plus two, there's six. Okay, okay. Then you could get, oh yeah, maybe there really are as many as 22. But then I'll ask you, how many partitions are there of 16? And you might make your own mental guess. And you might be surprised to learn that actually there's 231 partitions of 16. And you mean, that can't be right. Until you start saying, well, there's 16, there's 15 plus one. And by the time you got, you've gotten down to partitions whose largest part is seven, you've already written down many dozens and say, okay, okay, maybe there really are around 231 partitions of 16. But I can do this continually for larger and larger integers. And most of the time, you won't be able to guess a number that is large enough that's to, to actually be, be within range of the actual value. It's very difficult to come to grips with how to predict the rapid growth of these numbers. So is there a simple Sir? formula for P of N? Yes. Is there a question? What is partition? What? What is a partition? What is partition? Uh, yeah, so that's what, what I defined here a moment ago. A partition, are, a partition is uh, a non-increasing sequence of integers that add up to an N. A partition of n is a non-increasing sequence of numbers that add up to like four, right? Four is one partition of four. Three plus one is another partition of four. Two plus two is a third partition of four. Two plus one plus one is the fourth partition of four. And the very last one is five copies of one. So there's five partitions of four. If you carry out that calculation with these other, other numbers, like in the previous slide, and count, you'll find that the total counts grow at an incredible rate. So you could ask, is there a simple formula for P of N? And I think I've set it up so that you would probably doubt that there's a simple formula for P of N. What would be simple enough to give an expression like that? 
So if you don't, can't find a simple formula for P of N, the next thing you would ask is, can you approximate with, with, with minimal error how quickly these numbers grow? And Ramanujan together with Hardy did this. This was actually Ramanujan's idea. So although we call this the Hardy-Ramanujan formula, uh, this is really Ramanujan's idea that Hardy helped uh, uh, write down a rigorous proof of. So it turns out that the number of partitions of N, right, when I said P of four is five, this would be on the left-hand side, the single number five when little N is four. What they proved is that this very complicated function on the right, one over four N times the square root of three times E to the pi root two N over three is a very strong approximation to P of N. What does this tilde symbol mean? It means that if you were to divide the right-hand side into the left-hand side and substitute in larger and larger numbers of N, these ratios would tend to a limit and they would rapidly tend to a limit of one. This is not the, the, the optimal kind of formula that you might like coming out of an advanced calculus class, but I assure you, this is really quite a striking formula. What is E? E is what we teach. It's the, the, the ordinary base for the natural logarithm. And so when I asked earlier, is there a simple formula for P of N? Well, even to this day, there is no simple formula for P of N. Uh, and there are exact formulas for P of N, which all have some flavor, which uh, uh, is based on this very first work of Hardy with Ramanujan. So what does that formula mean? Well, let me just illustrate what I said in words in, in a table. So how many partitions are there of 10? It turns out that there's 42 of them. If you plug in for N, 10, into the ugly expression that Hardy and Ramanujan found into a calculator or a computer, you get a number like 48.1. How close is that? Well, if you actually divide P of N into the hardy ramanujan formula, you don't get a number as big as one. You'll get that it's about 87% correct. It's, it's not even an A, it's, but uh, uh, for, if N is 10, it, it's missing about 13%. However, if you calculate the number of partitions for 20, there are 627 of them. Their formula overcounts and gives you 692, and it does a little bit better. It's about 90% correct. By the time you get to 100, the number of partitions of 100 is, this, is around 190 million. Their formula overcounts again, about 199 million, but as a percentage, it's getting better. And by the time you get to 100,000, these two columns are too, uh, would be numbers that are too large to fit in these columns. So I just write large number and large number. But if you carry out this ratio, it's really quite close. It's about 99.8% correct. So if you are wondering what it means to say that Ramanujan is the man who knew infinity, this is really the process that we're explaining. The Hardy-Ramanujan formula in the context of counting partitions gets more perfect as n tends to infinity. And in a, pro, in a poetic way, filmmakers and, and Robert Canigal, who wrote Ramanujan's biography, like this title because they find it so striking that for such a simple to state problem, which is very obviously difficult at first glance, the formula that, that they've obtained gets more perfect as n goes to infinity. So for those of you who, of course, know calculus and advanced calculus, you know this is just the stuff of asymptotic expressions, the existence of limits. Uh, but for the uh, non-mathematically inclined, it's a beautiful idea. And I like very much that they chose to call Man Ramanujan the man who knew infinity because of a, a beautiful example that explains what a limit is that starts with just child's play. I see that some there, someone's there's some ha raised hands. Yes. Maybe so there's a, good a couple time. of questions yeah. in the chat. Uh, so a couple of questions. So one is why do E and pi show up in the formula? Well, they don't have to sh show up in the formula. I can replace them by other constants, but E and pi are the ones that you happen to know. Um, uh, maybe that's not the question that you're really asking. The real question is this. It turns out that when you write down the generating function for P of N, it's an example of what's called a theta function. And if you've had a course in complex variables, you will know uh, that the coefficients of certain analytic functions are given by means of integrals. So in calculus, you study Taylor series. 
and where you study the Taylor series, you study Taylor series and um, in Taylor series, you learn that the coefficients are basically iterated derivatives, special values of iterated derivatives of functions. That's Taylor's theorem. In complex analysis, there's a similar theorem uh, and, it's, uh, and it's called um, uh, the Cauchy integral formula where formulas in, 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 in the Laurent expansions of these functions calculate and depend on what are called the residues of these functions. And you can locate these residues by comparing against the exponential function. And that's the real source of the E and the pi. It, it comes from an uh, application of Cauchy's residue formula. Any other questions I should take at this time? Uh, yeah, Bijayan had a question. Uh, Bijayan, if yeah. you can ask. Is there any explicit formula for the error term of the approximation? That was just yes. Formula? Yeah, that's the In beginning of it. Whatever the elementary function. So there's several formulas for the error term in the hardy ramanujan formula. Uh, Rademacher wrote down the error term as a, an infinite convergent sum of what are called Klusterman sums times Bessel functions. Uh, that might not be very satisfying for you. Uh, about 10 years ago, together with Jan Brunier, I wrote down a finite formula uh, for P of N in terms of what are called singular moduli. And if you study that paper, you'll realize that uh, the hardy ramanujan formula is one of the pieces of our finite formula. So if you look at that, you'll see that the error term really isn't an error term. You just have to identify what that error term means and figure out how to uh, identify them. And, and we did that about 10 years ago. Any further questions? Any questions that are related to this slide? I, uh, this slide I can take uh, more. Uh, uh, yes? Yep. When we increase our number, difference between HR formula and PN uh, gets increasing rapidly. What yes. does this mean? Means uh, our accuracy is increasing, but difference between those two are also increasing. That's true. That's true. Right. And it turns out that the error term, I, that's what I meant when I really didn't want to say this was an error term. It really isn't an error term. There's a secondary term, which is also increasing in size just not as quickly as the main term. And we and we we know how to describe that completely. Thank you. And uh, Anushka, I see you raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes, good evening, Professor. Um, I would really appreciate it if you could um, spread the shed some more light on the um, ellipse uh, observation that Ramanujan made. I did notice in his notes that he had included some lines um, uh, about eccentricity of an ellipse and the area. So could you please um, talk about Ah, uh, okay. Um, yeah, I, 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 hmm. that, that I can't answer so quickly. Uh, I do want to get to the rest of this talk. So um, yeah, how, how to say, maybe we could return to that after my talk. Uh, I think it'll be some time at the question and answer session. Would that be okay? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Sir. So I, yes. Sir, when you calculate the sum of four, you only get uh, natural numbers. How with fractionals, uh, half, six times adding, we also get four. I didn't understand the question. Uh, Sudarshan, could you type your question in the chat and we'll take it towards the very end? Yeah. Thank okay, you, so let me, can let me proceed. All right, okay, so I think, I think everyone gets the idea that this is really quite a remarkable formula. Questions about where it comes from are brilliant questions. Refining it are, are of course, natural questions, most of which has now been done, okay? So I don't want to mislead anyone into thinking that uh, we don't know uh, exact formulas for P of N now, uh, but we do. And there are various forms of them all of them that have benefited from this original first work of Hardy and Ramanujan. Another famous theorem that Ramanujan wrote down uh, relates to, instead of the size of P of N, relates to the divisibility property of P of N. So the P of Ns are integers, and so you could expand them in terms of uh, uh, various expansions to different bases. So if you study the divisibility, instead of discussing the size, which would be mostly about the significant digits, uh, we're now interested in the insignificant digits. And there's a beginning of a pattern. Let me just show you. 
if I list every fifth partition number beginning at four, P of four is five, what will you notice that every fifth partition number beginning at P of four is a multiple of five. If you've never seen this before, uh, and even if you have seen this before, let's just try to reflect on what that means. Is there anything about the process of adding and counting that says every fifth partition number after you've counted them all up must automatically be a multiple of five? If you find such an explanation, tell me, because I've never seen anything like this. All right. It's really rather remarkable. Seeing this pattern is quite simple, but coming up with a good explanation for why the partitions of 34, all 12,310 of them, why they must break up into groups of five uh, is a mystery. And that's not obvious. Does this pattern continue on and on? It does. And Ramanujan proved for every n that p of 5n plus 4 is a multiple of 5. I like, I like it for its simplicity. And when you reflect upon it, you realize this isn't a trivial statement. Ramanujan also proved that with respect to the modulus 7 and 11, p of 7n plus 5 is always a multiple of 7. Every 11th partition number beginning at 6 is also a multiple of 11. What is special about 5, 7, or 11? Or maybe there are many others, and maybe these are not so special. Well, it turns out, and this wasn't proven until about 20 years ago, that the only congruences of this shape, where the modulus 5 is um, the same as the divisibility modulus 5, where the arithmetic progression 7 is the same as the divisibility modulus 7, uh, the only cases where the arithmetic progression is modulus equal to the divisor are the three that are listed here. Never happens again. These are the only congruences that are this simple. And I'll tell you, this was a very difficult theorem to prove. If you don't find a congruence, why do you know that as the primes go to infinity, there won't occasionally be, but rather rarely, any others? And it's rather... Uh, and so uh, you can search with the computer, not find any, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any out there. It's like the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Maybe we've never met little green men from Mars, but how do you prove that there aren't little green men and from some galaxy way out in space? In mathematics, you could prove it. And this was uh, a theorem proven by Scott Algren and my former PhD student, uh, um, Matt Boylan. There are no further congruences like that. There are many more, much more complicated congruences. as I was involved in that work, but none that are as simple as what Ramanujan wrote down. So you might ask, as, as tantalizing as these questions about size and divisibility are, are there other elementary to state questions about P of N that could still be used to, to inspire uh, young students today? And this is the last topic, but it's still about P of N. So this function isn't as famous, but it, you might find this more striking than what I wrote down a moment ago. So this is a function I define called the function f of n. And it's quite simply defined to be the first digit of p of n. Now, f of n is the first digit of p of n when expressed as an integer in base 10. But of course, there's one of these functions for every base you might choose. If you wanted to write down p of n in binary, there would be a corresponding f of n, except that's rather silly. The first digit of every number in binary is a one. But if you were to write it in base three, you would have two options for the first digit, a one or a two. If you were to write down p of n in base 13, there'd be 12 possible values for the first digit, right? In this case, let's only consider the function f of n in the ordinary base 10, although what I'm about to describe is well known now for all bases. So if we were to consider the partition number P of 10, there's 42 partitions of 10. The first digit of 42 is F of 10. So that's the number four. For the number of partitions of 20, there's 627 in total. What is the first digit? It's a six. F of 20 therefore just records the six. The number of partitions of 30 is 5,604. That first digit is five. So f of 30 is five, so on and so forth. Is there anything interesting that can be said about the first digit when you write down the partition numbers in order in base 10 and say in any base? 
So a natural question, what is the frequency? What is the frequency of the possible nine values of f of n? Right, zero is of course never the first digit of any positive integer in any base. So the only possible values for the first digit in base 10 are the numbers one through nine. And I could ask, does every one of these possible values, does every one of them occur with its equal fair share, frequency one ninth? That's a completely reasonable expectation. There are only nine possible first digits, one through nine. Maybe every one of those first digits occurs with equal likelihood. So let's see what happens. To see what happens let's define a function called capital FB of X, which is a proportion, a percentage. The proportion of the first X values of P of N, whose first digit is B, right? So you're gonna list P of zero, P of one, all the way up to the last integer you encounter before X. And we're just gonna keep track of, say in a histogram, how often each of the first um, possible nine values occurs. So let me show you a table. So if we calculate the first 10 values of P of N, P of zero through P of nine, four of the first 10 values start with the digit one. P of zero is one, there's one of them. P of one is one, there's another one. And if you go through among the first 10 values, 40%, four of those first 10 values start with the digit one. Two start with two, two start with the digit three, one starts with the digit five. You know the one that starts with the digit five. That's the very first question I asked today. What is the number of partitions of four? It's five. P of four equaling five is the one value that's counted here that begins with the digit five. And then finally, the number that start with seven is 10. And you already saw that because P of five is exactly equal to seven. And I might ask, so what do you observe? And all of you would probably and correctly say, well, you observe nothing because 10 is an itty bitty number. You should never try to extrapolate from just 10 trials of anything. So let's go to 20. And you might say, well, that's not a lot, but out of the first 20 values, 35%, exactly seven begin with a one, four begin with a two, and we haven't yet first found a first example of a partition number that begins with nine. Who knows, maybe there are no partition numbers that begin with the digit nine. That would be striking. So let's, instead of going through the powers of 10, let's skip all the way up to 100. 100 is large enough that maybe you can start seeing the beginning of a pattern. Out of the first 100 values of P of N, exactly 33 begin with a one. Now that now you should be wondering, 33 is a lot more than its fair share, right? One ninth of 10 is like 11. You would expect if this was fair that there'd be about 11% of each of these possibilities. And out of the first 100 values of P of N, only three begin with the digit nine. All right, sir. Yes. Sir, I apologize for the interruption, but I had a question. Yes. Uh, is this distribution, can it not be explained by something like Benford's law? Yeah, that's exactly where I'm going. That's exactly where oh, I'm oh, going. Okay, okay, okay. That's exactly where I'm going. Thank you. You took a little bit of my thunder. So I'll, I will Sorry, tell sir. about Benford's law, but I'll give an example of how you prove a Benford's law. So, so, so let me continue. By the, you get, by the time you get up to 1,000, about 30.6% 30 begin with a one and only about 4.4 begin with the digit nine. And as was mentioned before, this kind of distribution has been observed in other data sets. All right, by the time you get to 2,500, a pattern is beginning to emerge. And then I could ask, do you recognize these percentages? And I can tell some of you have recognized these percentages, for example, based on that question. And if you haven't, the question would be, do you recognize these numbers? And the theorem, this was proven by some of my research students about 10 years ago, uh, Tess Anderson, Larry Rowland, and Ruth Stair. Larry Rowland is now a famous number theorist. 10 years later, he's a professor at Vanderbilt. Uh, 
there, uh, Tess is also now a famous mathematician and professor at Purdue. They wrote this while they were undergraduate students in, at the University of Wisconsin. Ruth Stair is a mathematical scientist that works and she builds rockets. Uh, so I like this theorem because it really is an example of how Ramanujan's mathematics can be used to inspire students where there's still opportunities to prove theorems that are new. And what they proved as undergraduate students is that for each of the possible nine digits, one through nine, there is a limiting value. As the limit as X goes to infinity, it, it, it approaches these numbers. This is, there's a more precise way of stating this, but it, it approaches these, these proportions as indicated by the previous slide. So the question is, what's going on? So as I said, they, they were college students back in 2009, and now they're famous scientists, okay? So if you are in your early 20s and are looking for things to do that will help inspire you, maybe through Ramanujan's mathematics or some other mathematics, great, because 10 years later, you too can be a professor. So this is them now, but if you go back in time, they, in my eyes, look like children when they were in their early 20s. Maybe they were like 19 when they did this. So why is this theorem true? And this is what's indicative of a lot of Ramanujan's mathematics. Maybe you can see a pattern. Maybe you can see a formula. But you are required, you're required to offer a proof. You need an explanation. And the reason I wanted to talk to you about uh, uh, this mathematics is that the phenomenon that I'm showing you here uh, is known and has been exhibited or at least noticed in many sets, but is rarely provable. So why is this theorem true? So let me lead you up to why you could heuristically expect a theorem like this, but then I have to show you how you would actually prove what your numerics suggests. And that is not so easy. So these percentages are actually quite familiar to you if you've ever studied a table of logarithms. Most of you are probably are young enough to, to, to have never seen actual books of tables of logarithms. But before the day of the computer, even when I was a student, uh, we often had to look up logarithm values because it was in a book. The calculations weren't at your fingertip. And I'm not that old, I'm 53. So log base 10 of two is about 0.301. Log base 10 of three minus log base 10 of two is 0.176. And you, if you take the, the difference of the log base 10 of consecutive integers from zero up to 10, what you get are these numbers in order. And these are the numbers that, I, uh, that appear in their theorem. Why is this theorem true? Well, I apologize if this is a little bit too low brow, but let me just explain what's going on. Let's just consider the special case of P of 32, which is 8,349. Yes? What is log? The logarithm function. It's the inverse of the exponential function. Maybe you use it as ln, the natural logarithm function. OK. So if you write P of 32 as 8,349, in, in scientific notation, you get this. And since we're only interested in the first digit, this 10, 10 to the third is irrelevant for our calculation. Therefore, if you take the log of P of 32 by the additive properties of log, you know log base 10 of P of 32 breaks down and is just log base 10 of 8.349 plus three, right? The log base 10 of 10 cubed is three, it comes down. So if you just ignore the three, you find that locating and identifying the first digit of P of 32 is most easily done in this way. So you can define a function P star to be log base 10 of this process. This is what it's mean to take the, the mod one reduction because three is divisible by one. This is what it's meant to take the mod one reduction of the logarithm function. That's what P star is. Why is the theorem true? Well, this function P star of n is always between zero and one. Log base 10 mod one is always a number between zero and one. And more importantly, the first digit of P of one is one, if and only if P star it returns a value no bigger than 0 
The first digit is two, if and only if P star of N lies between these consecutive values of log base 10 and so on. So why is our theorem true? Our theorem is true because this function P star, which is the log base 10 of P of N mod one, defines a map from the integers to the unit interval from zero to one. And if I place these red dots corresponding to log base 10 of the integers up to nine, up to 10 actually, which is one, on this plot, you'll get this unusual spacing of points. And what Benford, and this is the Benford law that was mentioned earlier, Benford's law is there should be, and there are many examples noticed in the real world where large data sets have the property that, any, that some maps that map to the interval zero to one is uniformly distributed once you filter them through the logarithm. All right, so the point is, if you consider log base 10 of the partition function mod one, the log function should be the uniformizer that ends up giving you a random distribution on this interval. If you do that and pull back under exponentiation, that's when you get these unexpected distributions of first digits. That's heuristically why you might believe the theorem to be true. How would you prove the theorem? So this is the work that Tess, Larry, and Ruth performed. It's a, it's a hard calculation. Confirming a conjecture often and generally requires an idea. And so, what they did was they recognized that they could use the original asymptotic formula of Hardy and Ramanujan combined with uh, the theory of uniform distributions as developed by Herman Weil. There's something called Weil's criterion for equidistributions. distributions. And if you're good at analytic number theory, if you're good at analytic number theory, you can show that the error terms in the hardy ramanujan formula are not sufficiently large to defy or forbid the use of Weil's criterion, right? So this makes use of the, the circle method, the theory of uh, what are called mas poincare series. And at the end of the day, if you put all of that together, you get this very strange property about the first digits of P of N. So it's something you can observe quite beautifully with a computer, but when you want to turn to the task of actually establishing or proving it, well, now that's where the work begins. So, so there's Great. one question that's... at this point. Yes. Uh, so what motivated mathematicians to study the first digit of the partition function? Well, I'm the one that made that question. And as a professor, I, my, my job is to inquire students who will go on to be important mathematicians. And so I like to find open problems that involve tools that help the students learn, but which are also exciting. So what motivated me to come up with that question? I, I was training three students who, I, who, who I, I strongly believe would be important mathematicians in the future. And I wanted to give them something exciting that had some history uh, that would inspire them to uh, uh, in their work. It is exciting for a young person to see what, uh, what some of the magical consequences of formulas of Ramanujan could be by themselves, rather than just having to read a book and say, the book says so, so it must be right. This extra step where you will become a participant in this uh, um, contribution to science is really something that I think is part of my job. Wow, okay, that, that was really nice. Um, okay. So if you have time for one more question. So is there a formula for the number of digits of P of N? Oh, yes, absolutely. And that, that follows from any exact formula, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it would be quite beautiful to look at. Um, uh, yeah. All right. So just starting with adding and counting, I hope I've come a long way. Hardy and Ramanujan together already showed the rapid size of the and the rapid growth, rapid growth in size of P of N rather precisely. Ramanujan gave birth to the study of the divisibility properties of P of N, which is now put to use in many places in number theory. And the, the little paper that I suggested to my students, as, we, as I just descript, described to you, the first digits uh, is stuff that can be accessed now if you use beautiful ideas of Ramanujan, Hardy, a little bit other modern mathematics, and uh, 
some of these fundamental contributions of Herman Weil, who was a very famous early analyst slash probabilist slash physicist. So to conclude, just rather quickly, I hope that you can appreciate my telling of the story of the legend of Ramanujan. Maybe it's exactly the story that you have been told, uh, but I, I do believe that at least some of the ways that I've described it uh, probably feels different. And as part of a global community, I hope that was something that, um, that, that you can take away as, as being quite instructive from this lecture. I like very much the fact that Ramanujan from every perspective arose from humble beginnings, right? Right now we live in a world where the world is very unfair. It's not a, a place where, uh, where inclusion is law, where equity is law. And I think it's important to remem remember that uh, Ramanujan could have easily been lost to the world. And the lesson that we learned from all of that is, well, moving forward, how, do, how would we know how to respond or inspire a Ramanujan if we were to encounter someone like that today? But it even goes beyond that because you don't have to be Ramanujan to be an important scientist. If that were the case, there would hardly be any scientists alive in the world. We need science, right? If, if anything, the results of the last few years clearly point to the need for educating a new generation of scientists. We face, in, uh, you know, it, it, as a species, many global challenges, whether it's climate change or whether it's a pandemic or where, whether it's the need for um, new source of energy, right? We recognize that, um, that the world in which we live is a rather delicate place. And uh, well, if the results of the last few years don't, inspire that as a, as a critical need, then I think we may all be doomed. And I certainly hope that that is not the case. And so we need not only Ramanujans, but an army of strong scientists who will be making the world a better place for all of us. The story of Ramanujan certainly um, is much more than a story. His ideas have powered much of modern mathematics. And with that, I hope that I've given you quite a bit to think about in terms of what you may individually be thinking about your careers, what you want to do in terms of your contributions to science. Uh, and uh, I guess that's all I have to say about that. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the wonderful lecture, Professor Ken. Uh, this was indeed fascinating how you started with uh, giving a Westerners perspective of Ramanujan, which I think everybody in the audience appreciated and moving on to the works of Ramanujan, how he arose from his humble back beginnings, as you said, and giving another instance of Benford's law, which I presume everybody that got their nerves on. And finally, the omnipresence of uh, Ramanujan's work. Um, so I'm sure like there are many, many questions which all of you have from this extremely inquisitive lecture. Um, so in the interest of time, we'll take the questions that are already asked in the chat and uh, I'll give you an email ID where you can type in the other question. Um, so uh, one question, um, uh, why are we looking specifically at the first digit of the partition function? Why not others, maybe the last? Well, the last is quite simple. That's related to congruences, right? So that P of five N plus four is a multiple of five is quite easily seen if you write down the partitions in base 10. So any congruence property is easily seen if you choose the right base for the expansion. So, so the last digits, I feel like that's, we've covered that. The first digits, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, it's an opportunity to, to talk about this very beautiful phenomenon of Benford, which if you get any books, you'll realize that it's difficult to prove Benford's law. It's easy to spot on a computer. And so I wanted to indicate that if you want to prove that in the case of the partition function, it's not so easy going. It's stuff that could be used to train uh, very strong uh, future scientists. And um, it's, it's a theorem that you can explain to a student as a goal, and they don't have to spend very much time explaining to anyone what their theorem says. But the proof is quite difficult. And so as a tool, uh, in the training of young young scientists, it was it was perfect at the time. Okay, thanks thanks for the uh, thanks for the answer. 
And uh, there's a question by Bishal. Bishal, if you're here, could you unmute and Bishal Dev? Hello, uh, am I audible now? Yes. Yes. Uh, hello, Professor uh, Ono. So my uh, question is a speculative question. So uh, was Ramanujan a human computer with a lot of computational data in his mind, which gave him tremendous amount of uh, uh, data. I mean, with his data, he got intuition and it helped him see patterns wh where others wouldn't. Ah, interesting philosophical question. So no, Ramanujan was not a computer. Um, he was definitely much more than um, someone who could carry out a large volume of calculations accurately and correctly. Now, for those of you who've been studying machine learning might object to how I just described a computer, right? You can teach uh, computers to learn so that they can perfect the kinds of calculations that they do, all right? But I maintain that even the definition uh, in, in the spirit of modern machine learning, uh, Ramanujan was not a computer. Uh, the, many of the ideas and formulas that he wrote down uh, were not the result of computing lots of examples and then finding a pattern. There are many cases, perhaps most cases, where it is clear that his ideas came from um, uh, you know, patterns that he observed in his brain, not the result of calculations. Um, there are, uh, and actually I'm, I'm rather disappointed about this. In the news, I think a year or two ago, it made world news about uh, a group of computer scientists who'd come up with the Ramanujan machine that could find and locate lots of identities, including some that Ramanujan had found. Um, you know, uh, I think that's hype, uh, right? Um, and so, yeah, maybe I, sh I, I shouldn't bash that. I mean, for what it is, it, it's interesting, but make no mistake, there is no machine that I imagine could ever replace the ingenuity and creativity that Ramanujan offered in his notebooks, uh, unless computers get to some level that transcends what humans are able to understand. Because as I said, a lot of the formulas that Ramanujan wrote down, we still have a difficult time today, despite 100 years of study, understanding the origin. So, it's, so it goes certainly far beyond uh, that. Right, thank you. Thank you, sir. And I think uh, with this, we can uh, call it uh, an, a wonderful close of day one of the STEMS 2022 camp. And so there are a couple of very, uh, very nice comments. So very interesting to see that you teach about Ramanujan first before getting into his math. This is not how most math classes happen because we directly jump into the math part without talking about any of the history. I'm sure your way is something that many other math teachers and professors can steal to make their math classes more inspiring. So that was a comment from uh, someone who in fact spreads, who is a math educator, Vinay Naya. And so uh, uh -huh. thanks, Professor. Thanks, Vinay, for the comment. And um, I'm for sure uh, you have many more questions about this extremely wonderful talk. And so I'll just put out a link in the chat where you can uh, write uh, your questions to us and we'll get them answered as soon as possible. So once again, do join me in thanking Professor Kenono for uh, delivering this wonderfully crafted lecture. Uh, thank you very much on behalf of everyone once again. And uh, right. we you. meet again on uh, Friday, that's the September 24th, 2021 at 5.30 p.m. IST where Professor Sara Shandera from the uh, Pennsylvania State University will give us an exciting tour into the world of gravity. And she's titled the lecture, Gravity, the Chemist. So with this, we can call it a day. And thanks everyone for attending and special thanks to Professor Kim. Thank you, Professor All right. Thank you. All right, bye bye everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It was a pleasure to Thank attend your session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Good day. Bye-bye.